Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. And today we're at Summit Art Space. Now this place is loaded with artists, and to be quite honest, each one of them deserves their own segment, but for time constraints, we're only able to talk to three. We're gonna talk to an artist and entrepreneur, April Couch. We're gonna talk to world-class wildfowl carver, Tom Baldwin, all about his ultra-realistic bird carvings. And to wrap this show up, we're going to talk to Ron White, an art teacher, a yoga instructor, and an artist who works in clay, charcoal, and in ice. Now to kick this show off, we're going to go talk about the rich history of the Summit Art Space Building, which was once home to the Public Library, the Akron Beacon Journal, and the Knight Brothers. That's right. We all know them from the Knight Foundation. Let's go see what this amazing history is all about. Where the Summit Art Space Building now stands, once stood the John F. and Catherine Miller Cyberling Mansion. And in 1927, the Akron Beacon Journal built the building you know of today to house their growing newspaper. The Knight brothers, John and James Knight, actually worked in the offices on the second floor of this building. Today, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation still enrich our city by supporting local artists and innovators. In 1938, the Akron Beacon Journal bought out their competitor, the Akron Times Press, and moved to High Street. The building then served as the Akron Public Library from 1942 to 1967. It also housed the Akron Art Institute from 1945 to 1949. Today, with the help and support of various local foundations, and those visionaries who saw a better use for this building, it's become a vibrant art space. With over 55,000 square feet of galleries and space that can be rented at an affordable rate. Today, the Summit Art Space is home to 20 amazing, extremely diverse artists. You're gonna find something that you like here. There is art for every level of tastes and they have galleries that continuously rotate new artwork in and out. It's also a home for theaters to put on plays, and through the year, there are various art-related festivities and festivals going on at Summit Art Space. On the first Saturday of every month, Summit Art Space is open to the public where you can see all the artists hard at work. It also has various art-related activities and festivals throughout the entire year, all of this and more can be found at Summit Art Space. Next up, we're here at the first floor of Summit Art Space, and we're going to talk to April Couch. Now, she's an artist and an entrepreneur that runs Totally Tangled Creations. Let's go see what this place is all about. I was good at what I did in the business world, but it was like dying slowly from the inside out. It, it didn't do anything for me. It didn't fulfill my need to be creative. So after 25 years, it's all just, you know, I think your mind and your body, it just tells you this is what you need. And when it started, it just started pouring out and it just keeps expanding and growing. And I don't even know how to contain it. <laughs> half the time because I have so many ideas and so many things I want to do and it's it's a it's a very exciting time for me at 50 to be doing something that I truly love doing and to be making a living at it it's it's amazing it's, it's mind-boggling is what it is I could not have written this script for it to happen like this at all I could not have planned it. It just continues to happen. It's more than about just going to art school. It's about knowing how to do different things with your art. You don't just have to paint. You don't just have to draw. You don't just have to sculpt what else can you do with it? And this is what I'm finding with what I'm doing. I will take one image, and if you look around the studio, it is in so many different 
um, mediums from buttons and wall plaques and prints and cards and t-shirts, one image. So if I have a hundred images and I'm doing that with a hundred images, then it's always fresh, it's always new. If I go to an art show and this year I'm going to take my images that I've laser engraved on ornaments. I've made them all into Christmas ornaments, which is what I did this year. In two hours, I sold out of my laser engraved ornaments. Same image, reasonably priced, different medium. It gives people something fresh, something new to look at. It's not always the same. It's always changing. Here in my studio, I offer pages from my coloring books for free. And I tell people this is not something that you have to feel like you have to finish right away. It's not a rush thing. So I start a folder for anyone who wants one. They can come at any time and pull that folder and work on that piece. So I have a um, lady that works for the city. She comes on her lunch break and she colors her page and she puts it back in her folder and she it waits there for her for the next time. And it's always free here in my studio. I, I, I give you know that away um, as a part of just wanting to give back and wanting to also build relationships with my customers. I want them to come here and find something to do that they don't have to pay for. I don't want them to always feel like they have to buy something when they come here. I have met too many young people when I was a teacher who was doing, who were doing things that their parents wanted them to do. Not that they were passionate about or not that they wanted to do. And I have talked with parents who said they won't support their kids in the arts at all. At the end of the day, we each have to live out our own lives and our own dreams. And one day our children will be adults in the workforce. And for my children, I want them to do something that's fulfilling, that brings them joy, uh, and that's meaningful to them. I don't want them to just go to work to a job to earn a paycheck. So I strongly encourage those parents who have creative children to not look at art and say, oh, you're gonna starve, but look at Oh, there's 90 different careers in the arts. You could be a museum curator. You could be an art illustrator. You could be um, a jewelry maker. You could be a metalsmith. You can be, um, you can design clothes. You can design glasses. All of those things is touched by the arts. Why can't we try something new? Why can't we do something new with art? Why does a few people get to, turn, get to determine what art is? Why can't I just see it and love it and appreciate it just the way it is? Why do I have to try to make it fit into that fine art mold that everybody wants to be in. Nothing wrong with fine art. Don't get me wrong, nothing wrong with fine art. But there's nothing wrong with doing something new and different either. And if new and different works, I'm going to keep doing new and different. And new and different works for me. 
what I'm doing is it's no, it's nothing amazing. It's nothing that other people can't do. But my vision for it is endless. And I just keep pushing the umbrella of what I can do with it. And the more I push, the more I grow, the more I know. Next up, we're here on the third floor of Summit Art Space Building, and we're gonna talk to Tom Baldwin. Now, this guy is a world-class wildfowl carver. Now, his carvings are so realistic, you might mistake them for actual birds. Let's go see what this guy is all about. Well, I went to Cooper School in Cleveland, which was supposed to be a uh, commercial art school. Uh, you know, it was like a three-year project, go up and really get your commercial arts polished up, figure work for an agency or, you know, something like that. But unfortunately, the pamphlet that they put out didn't really show that they had changed the school's direction to a, uh, a fine arts direction. And I get up there and it's all this, uh, it's all this abstract stuff. And it was really disappointing. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't even finish, I went for two years and I couldn't even work the master I wanted to work on, uh, which, which was cartooning. I really wanted to get into doing cartooning. I was interested in editorial cartooning. Uh, really enjoyed that aspect of it. And I did it for a local paper for like three years. So I, I had my hands at it a little bit, but uh, yeah, the school wouldn't recognize cartooning as an art form. And I got into a huge argument with the dean about that. I thought, you know, they're giving scholarships to a girl who puts her face in a Xerox machine and puts it in a frame. And, and I spend, you know, 20 hours doing a drawing and they tell me it's not art. It's like, uh. so the, the school took a whole different direction. I never finished. I was very disappointed in the whole setup. I uh, kind of went my own way after that. Bird carving in particular, uh, I don't know if most people really know that it's really an indigenous art form for the Americas. Um, as we all know, this, this country is built uh, out of just immigrants everywhere from all over the all over the globe and they bring their customs with them but they didn't bring decoy making with them they learned that from the Native Americans and even they weren't carving wood per se they were using reeds and grasses and actual skins of birds they hunted prior to, to drape it over these uh, things uh, creating what what they call a kind of a confidence area for for birds you know they put these fake uh, Reed made duck looking shape things in, the, in a shallow area, and then real birds go, Oh, hey, there's a bunch of my buddies down there, let's go on down. And the Indians get their bow and arrows and go to work. But we learned about decoying from the Native Americans, and I think it's the nature of the immigrants that came over who were woodworkers. You know, in Europe before they got here, the great boat builders and so on and so forth, you know, wood was a big product to be used. So they started carving them out of wood start making their confidence decoys, if you will, out of wood. It started here, and uh, I enjoy that aspect of it. Uh, so I've had people refer to this as a craft. I got news for them, far, far from it. I've had to use everything I've learned as an artist all my life to do this. It is not a craft. Uh, it's definitely a fine art thing. And, uh, uh, well, that's, that's kind of its history. It's, it's an indigenous American art form. And uh, I'm real, real pleased to be part of that. We kind of uh, are responsible for making something of a, what I call a kind of a split second narrative. I mean, when we do this bird, we're kind of responsible to kind of show how it would live or what, you know, what would happen in its normal day of life. You couldn't, uh, you know, put a, a penguin in a palm tree kind of thing. I'm sure it probably could happen because birds are transient, but it would be very, very unusual. <laughs> but so you want to you look for normal uh, habitat situations that a bird would sit in and, and, and create those narratives. because. Uh, in, in the carving world, everybody starts with the decoys of the ducks. I did, but I, I got bored with them after about two years because 
basically they're flat bottom, they sit on a shelf, and they're quite beautiful, but as an artist I felt like I wanted to say more. And I started looking at the bird carvings with the branches, and the, you know, or, or if it's a hawk, maybe a dead bird in its talons. It's, you know, there's, there's a story going on there. There's, there's a little more than just carving a nice looking bird. There is an element of part of its life being explained. And I liked that challenge. I like that aspect of it. Uh, so I kind of weaned away from ducks. I mean, I, I do one once in a while. I still like them, they're fine. And I know some guys that do terrific flat bottom ducks. They're wonderful, they're beautiful. But it's just not what I want. Uh, I want a little more in, in, the, uh, in the process. So I enjoy the, 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 whole, the whole thing, like back here. You know, you get the branch, everything about it. There's a story happening here. And I like that challenge. element of research into the carvings is pretty extensive because the competitions that we go to, uh, the real bird is the criteria. So the object is to make your wood carving look as real as possible. And there are people out there that do a terrific, excellent, stupendous job at that, and you're competing against these individuals. Uh, so you have to research as much as they do. Uh, obviously, I shoot my own pictures, I go out and do my own observations, sometimes I do drawings. Sometimes I make a clay model of the piece I'm going to make before I actually carve it as a kind of a three-dimensional representative blueprint, if you will. Uh, and this is probably the most popular tool we use, is this, this little micrometer, and uh, everything's measured. You know, how, how wide the beak is, how long this is, how far the eyes are apart, so on and so on. You know, how wide are these feathers, yada, yada. You just get into all these itty-bitty details because it's there. Uh, I would pleased to say that last April at the World Championships, a 30-year goal was realized. I received uh, uh, second place in world-class interpretive. So I'm now in world-class. Uh, which, you know, when I first went to this show back in the late 80s, I went up to the stage where all those world-class carvings were and they were just mind-boggling and wonderful. But I looked at it and I thought, you know, I can get here. I didn't feel like it was out of reach. I didn't think I was there yet, but I felt I could learn to be that, that good at my craft. And uh, so I just set that as one of the goals uh, to get there. I managed to get there last year. There's the uh, ribbon for the piece right there. Um, so yeah, great. <laughs> so now I'm only allowed to, to uh, compete in the uh, master and world-class levels, and that's fine. Competition is fierce. The talent is immense. The quality of the work is mind-blowing. My kind of my kind of action. I like it. Now to wrap this show up, we're here on the third floor of Summit Art Space with Ron White. Now Ron White is a yoga teacher, an art teacher. He works in large-scale clay, charcoal, and with ice. Let's go see what this guy's all about. I've always been. I don't know. I have to work with speed because I was told younger, that the most honest mark is the first. So you have to keep constantly looking at that as the first mark. So you're as honest as you can be. So I think with that in mind, I, I keep looking for that, searching for that, and then before I know it, all the marks are done. It was expressed to me once that it's Mother Earth. And when you look under a microscope, the cell structure is very similar to our blood. So then I got fascinated with women who are pregnant. They, they want to eat clay and all the health properties of clay and that kind of thing. And it started to just become, I don't know, kind of, kind of real close to me in that nature. Uh, then I started to work with it and realized that it's both positive and negative, additive and subtractive. Because right? I did stone carving, ice carving, those kind of things, but those are you know, purely subtractive, mostly. Because um, the ice carving, you can fuse stuff back on with liquid nitrogen, but you'll always be able to tell that you took it off. It's never like clay. You can just score, you know, score and slip and attach, and it's on. The 
When I first started, I was into um, hyper-realism, like it was photorealism, and you can, people would come in and they would give me that gallery time of that's now about seven, eight seconds. That's what you get in a major gallery for each piece. That's the time that you get. And it was true, they would come into my space and look at each piece and be like, wow, Ron, that's exactly, okay, thank you, right? But they were, so then I started to do pieces that were a little more of a character, a little more, I, I don't wanna, say caricature, that's annoying to me because I want my pieces to be a little bit above or beyond that, right? So it has a little more meaning, but they are characters um, with social reference, political reference and whatnot. So I went to the studio and swore to myself as soon as I started to get too analytical, too measured, too precise, I would stop and leave. So that happened a lot that evening and I made pieces that were almost abstract. They were really tall and really thin, I don't know how to describe this, they were just stretched and elongated and I made three of those pieces, took them to what used to be the red light galleries and I, I couldn't even be there for their exhibition the first time. I had to leave and go to an event, an ice carving event, and they all sold while I was gone to a collector in Columbus. So I'm like, okay, thanks, I got it, <laughs> you know? So then I started to just push that in different directions but not be so abstract because that kind of was outside of where I wanted to be at that time and they've been wonderful. People come into the studio and they're like, this reminds me of my uncle or this reminds me of my cousin or my brother and that is what I want. So these murals, I have a basic idea that I go in with and I have major components that will deliver. Then in the process of drawing them, other ideas will start to happen or conversations that I have with passerby, you know, then that'll start to create something. Then I have to go back into the computer, back into research, hire models to come in and then creates even more and more and more, right? Then I have to start to back off a little bit because I'm maybe overfilling it and I have to edit, maybe not, you know, and then all of a sudden there's just spaces left that, um, compositionally I have to fill, so then I have to hire models to come in. Do they even have anything to do with the content of the work? I don't know. And I'm okay with that, you know, because now there's leftover space for people's minds to move and shift through, and I really like that a lot. I, I tend to lead my life fast and furious, like I'm saying that this, you know, speed of light kind of thing. And I, I, I don't know, it's just part of me, but then again, it can become a whirling dervish and I need to calm it down and find center. Yoga has helped me do that a lot. Um, the practice of it, I, what I like about it is I can plan it and I can set a time. I'm going to start here and I'm going to finish here and I can sort of set an alarm and know that I have some wiggle room. But then I have this amount of time to do yoga and be in a moment in a space that's calm. And I think it's the ability to kind of be inside yourself and know how that works and then look at my pieces and be inside them and see how they work. The first one for parents is I always say, please name one thing on the planet that it didn't take an artist to create, just one, because there isn't. Right? So artists are everywhere, designers, all that. So really ultimately, if, if you want to make money at art, you have to be the maker, the inventor, the doer, the studier, the learner, right? So then I go to the kid and I'm like, what kind of kid are you? And there's usually three kind of types. The one that was somehow naturally born with an artistic talent and all they have to do is touch it and it just explodes into this beautiful art. Then you have the middle kid that has to try a little bit. They have to do a little more research. They have to work. They have to discover and make and then oh then it happens then you have this kid that just has to struggle ha I mean and nothing is easy ever but the end goal can all be the same just how they got there totally different right I have found that the middle or complete struggler are the ones that actually go to college and make a success out of themselves in art because it isn't just natural it doesn't just come they've had to struggle so they're familiar with struggle not that that's a constant um, but that's what I found so far as a teacher. I used the word style early on and the professor looked at me and said with laughter, sarcastic laughter, you're too young to have a style. 
you have a mark. Okay, I, I really liked that then I had a vocabulary word to use. I have a mark. So I need to continue using this mark, expanding this mark, utilizing the mark, and then let it start to have a conversation. When that mark starts to have a conversation within itself, around itself, now you're starting to have a style, right? And I think that happens later. I, I think as an attitudinal young artist, my style, right? So I, I like the, the use of that term, a mark, and I constantly try to use that with my kids. You know, what is your mark? Make a mark. And it, when they're nervous about even starting on a page, make a mark, right? I really like that whole concept. So, and, but then you can't let it go. Like it has to continue to change and evolve as you evolve. Thank you for watching yet another episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have an idea for a segment or you just want to say hey, you can reach out on the website at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen or you can reach me on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll see you next time on Around Akron with Blue Green. 